Hi everyone, um, welcome. Thank you for signing up to and attending our webinar. Um, this is the second webinar in a four part series. The first webinar for those of you that joined us in January discussed AI and polytrauma. You've joined us today for this webinar discussing the intersection of AI and brain injury. We do have two further webinars to bring to you as part of this series, the AI and spinal cord injury webinar on the 12th of June um, and also the AI and paediatrics webinar on the 25th of September. So please do sign up to those if you are interested. Our National Brain Injury Conference has also recently gone live. Um, this year it will be taking place on the 4th of July at the studio in Birmingham. We'll pop the link in the chat box now for you to sign up to if you are interested. So just a couple of general housekeeping points then before we move on to introduce the session. This is a live webinar that means that if you uh, you won't be able to turn on your mics or your cameras. So please do submit any questions at any point throughout the webinar via the Q&A function on your screen and we'll get to them at the end. When you do submit your questions, if I can just ask that you pop your name and your email address on there. Um, if for any reason we don't manage to get to the question in the session, we'll send you an email response afterwards. The session is being recorded, so once the webinar has finished, we'll circulate a copy of the recording to you. Um, towards the end of the session, we'll send you out a feedback link. If you could just spare a moment to let us know what you thought of the session, mm. that would be really helpful. So as you know, we're here today to discuss AI and brain injury. Um, my name is Georgie Woolmer. I am a serious injury solicitor in our Sheffield team. Uh, Dr Edmund Bonakowski joins us today as well as our guest speaker. Dr Bonakowski runs a, a work portfolio which includes being um, founder and, and medical director of NRC Medical Experts. Um, he is clinical director of neuro rehabilitation for Somerset NHS Foundation Trust and is involved in research at Cambridge University into AI and medical rehabilitation. The session is scheduled to run for around an hour. Um, following my brief introduction, um, Dr. Bonikowski will deliver a session discussing the present uh, and future potential applications of AI and brain injury rehabilitation. This will last for around 45 minutes and will include image analysis, outcome prediction and clinical decision support systems. As mentioned, we will have some time at the end for questions and I know that a few have been pre-submitted already. So AI, a, continu a continuously involving field, um, a recent Manchester Law Society event has described AI as the industrial revolution of its time. AI is playing a pivotal role in reshaping um, the legal and the medical landscape surrounding brain injury, and it really is just the beginning. In recent years, AI has emerged as a powerful tool in diagnosing, treating and understanding brain injuries with unprecedented accuracy and efficiency. From advanced imaging techniques um, to predictive analytics, AI assists medical professionals in delivering more personalised care and also aims to better provide outcomes for patients living with brain trauma. In the legal arena, AI is starting to offer insights into the intricacies of brain injury cases. Whilst integration is still making its way throughout the legal sector, AI promises in the not too distant future to aid in accurate assessments of damages, in liability decisions and in overall long-term prognosis following injury. Its ability to analyse vast amounts of data will hopefully enable legal professionals to navigate complex, med complex medical areas and evidence with increased confidence and precision. However, as we look deeper into the integration of AI and brain injury, it is important to recognise that we aren't there yet. Whilst AI promises groundbreaking advancements and ultimately in the future won't be optional, we must consider grey areas or blind spots and how we can account for them when using the tools. So I've tried to do that today by using a bit of AI myself. Um, so when asked what risks we should consider when integrating AI into the legal and medical professionals, it's warned us to consider the following. It recommends that we watch out for a lack of accountability and responsibility in its decision making. From a data security perspective, AI considers itself vulnerable to cyber attacks. AI warns of diminished human oversight, which can lead to errors or missed opportunities for intervention. It explains that dependency on AI may erode critical thinking skills and medical judgment in professionals. It states that the inability to understand the full spectrum of human emotions and experiences 
may lead to misinterpretation of or oversimplification of brain injury cases. It says that AI presents a loss of human connection and empathy to our healthcare system and warns of ethical considerations arising from AI decisions on life and death situations. So interesting suggestions and definitely food for thought that I think Dr. Bonikowski will pick up on as we go through. Um, as introduced above, this webinar series aims to explore not only the remarkable advancements that AI brings to the table, but also the challenges that lie ahead. It's hoped that by encouraging dialogue and collaboration between the legal and medical professionals, we can harness the full potential of AI whilst ensuring its responsible integration into society. So I'll now hand over to Dr. Bonikowski. Good afternoon. Right, I'm assuming that I'm live. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to, uh, as Georgie has said, this uh, webinar on AI and brain injury. Uh, I'm Edmund Bonikowski uh, and my medical discipline is neurorehabilitation medicine. So <coughs> without further ado, these are my disclosures. Georgie's already mentioned them. Uh, I've got three hats that I wear in my portfolio and they all relate to one another. Uh, it's a busy time, uh, but AI is finding its way into, into each one of those. <clears throat> and you might wonder how I come to be giving this talk. Well, a couple of points about that. One is this is this is how I progressed through my career. Started as a chartered mechanical engineer, which has proved extremely useful when thinking about systems in the latter part of my career. Uh, had a detour into general medical practice. Uh, finally washed up as a GMC specialist in rehab medicine. And now I find myself working at the interface of engineering and medicine, which I think is probably what I always hoped to do. And uh, I, I'm very glad to be uh, able to share some of those insights with you today. Uh, interestingly, uh, and perhaps I hope Elvis won't mind me saying this, but I, I, got, I received a flyer about this uh, webinar and I thought, oh gosh, this looks interesting, fantastic. So I signed up immediately. And then about two days later, I received a request to deliver it. So I'm uh, hoping that I match expectation. Um, in my work uh, in Cambridge, I'm and relevant to the general practice bit here. Uh, I'm also see, overseeing some uh, work on AI and triage in primary care. So uh, today uh, in, well, what's going to be probably more like 35 or 40 minutes, uh, and, and 15 for questions. I want to um, take a whistle stop tour uh, of this enormous and emerging area to stimulate interest really, uh, instill a sense of realism. And I think this is really important amidst all the hype and there is massive hype uh, out there about uh, AI, which I think is probably unhelpful. I want to describe the state of the art if I can and share a vision for improving uh, rehabilitation. And here are the broad headings I'll use. So I hope some of them will be of interest to you. Uh, what is AI? What's enabled the explosion? Uh, where will the data come from? How are computers developing? What are algorithms? Uh, I apologize, by the way, if you know, I don't know my audience today. So uh, some of this may be uh, you know, passe and some of it may be beyond. Uh, I don't know uh, what, how you will receive it, but I hope there are some bits within it that are of interest. What kind of research is emerging in uh, on applications of AI and brain injury? Uh, and uh, some other important points that come out of the literature. Uh, and <clears throat> I want to talk about an AI enabled rehabilitation platform that we are considering in Cambridge and some emerging themes. So what is AI? Well, of course, I asked ChatGPT, didn't I? Uh, naturally enough. Um, by the way, I didn't ask ChatGPT to write my talk. I did ask it to give me some slide headings originally, and it gave me 13 ridiculously generic headings, which were effectively uninteresting. So uh, I, I take, um, apart from this couple of slides, I, I take credit for writing my own talk. AI, artificial intelligence, it, it refers to the development of computer systems. Now, I, I, computer systems, well, no, not really. I, I disagree with that. I think it, it, it refers to the development of systems uh, that perform tasks that typically require human intelligence. I mean, AI has been around for a long time, predating even the computer, but certainly there are research studies predating fast computers. So it, nowadays it is about developing computer systems. 
uh, and these tasks uh, include learning, reasoning, problem solving, etc., uh, and even interacting with the uh, environment. Uh, AI systems are designed to mimic cognitive functions associated with human minds. Uh, various types of AI, narrow, uh, general, uh, we're hearing a lot about general AI and this is really where a lot of the panic is being uh, created. Um, and most systems uh, currently are use narrow AI or weak AI, uh, which um, uh, excel in specific tasks such as language translation, image recognition, and so forth. And I love the way uh, weak AI or narrow AI uh, is driving vehicles. I can't imagine a more dangerous thing than driving a vehicle. Um, I did hear on the radio recently some commentary talking about the development of AI and they were saying, well, to the audience, do, do you really think that all the people who are developing these systems in California and indeed in London here with WAVE, some people I knew in Cambridge developed the, 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 uh, the WAVE business, do you think they're driving around in cars that uh, are autonomous? Of course they're not, because they know how dangerous it is. And I think there's a lesson there for us. Uh, AI has great hype, great potential, but really there's a long journey ahead. The definition continues. It, it incorporates a wide range of techniques and most interestingly for us today, machine learning, uh, deep learning, which is part of machine learning, NLP, computer vision, and so forth. These, these technologies <clears throat> enable AI systems to analyze large amounts of data, recognize patterns, make predictions and improve their performance over time through learning. And that's the really critical and interesting thing. These systems can improve their own learning <coughs> uh, over time. And Georgie's already said it, but you know she's done part of my talk for me. But you know AI has a significant potential to revolutionise various industries, including healthcare. Uh, but by automating now these these things in in bold here are really where some of the anxieties are coming in, in society. By automating tasks, enhancing decision making, and unlocking new capabilities, these are the things that are frightening people. Um, but as, as Georgie has said, it raises ethical, social and economic considerations uh, like privacy, job displacement, bias, which is a huge issue in um, uh, AI and machine learning and potentially control over autonomous systems. It depends how far we are prepared to let these systems um, develop. Um, and, and why has AI gathered such pace recently? Because as I, as I alluded to, there is quite a long literature uh, talking about artificial intelligence. Uh, indeed, today, uh, quite, yeah, you, you'll be aware that you know, if, you, if you express an interest in anything in a search on the internet, <clears throat> that all of a sudden in your email, you start receiving one um, suggestion after another. And even this morning, I, I received a paper uh, from 2007 talking about the application of artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, in the prediction of rehabilitation outcomes. So that's 17 years ago. Uh, well, that sure as hell hasn't hit the headlines yet. Uh, and so I think it gives you a bit of an idea about the, the pace of change here. Um, so the, re the, the enablers of the AI explosion are that data has become uh, widespread, so big data, genomics, biomarkers and scans, so forth. Computers have become faster. Uh, I'll put a slide up about more law in a while and talk a little about quantum computing and algorithms have become more sophisticated. And here's a here's a point to take away. If applications become economically viable, and that's a big if, the pace will only increase. Now I come back to that point because it relates to development funding in due course. So digging into the enablers um, a bit, we can ask, well, where will uh, brain injury data come from? And it'll come from these various places, some of which you'll recognise as pretty easy, pretty straightforward, and some you'll also recognise as being extremely difficult to access. So medical records, typed and handwritten, biomarkers, I've got a slide on that, CT uh, scans, various types of scans. This is a major research focus here uh, in, in diagnostic and predictive uh, AI. Uh, clinical records, so clinical examination, sensory motor autonomic neuronal damage, interventions, neuropsychological tests, yeah, the list is pretty endless. 
Um, one area that I'm particularly interested in is the functional timeline, so how people actually function uh, and how well that is recorded, presented and so forth. And then, of course, you've got a symptom timeline. So there's huge amounts of potential data. And for biomarkers, we see an ever expanding discovery uh, relating to traumatic brain injury, particularly. So we've got the neuronal cell injury biomarkers, glial cell, axonal injuries, look at the mushrooming, mushrooming. And as research goes on in these uh, basic sciences, uh, so the opportunities to mine this data uh, will also mushroom. But uh, commensurate with that will be the challenges of doing that in an efficient and effective way. And if we consider function, uh, we have so many other basic dimensions. This uh, this kind of plot will be familiar to you. Um, certainly the, the therapists and the clinicians amongst you. This is a what we call a splat plot. Uh, it's quite a disingenuous name. But anyway, it, it's a it's a, 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 a representation of a multidimensional functional um, assessment of. In fact, in this case, this is a population, but it would be just the same if it was an individual. And you know what you can see here is that you've got 30 dimensions and within those dimensions, you've got seven points. Well, that's an awful lot of uh, data potentially, but even that doesn't tell the full story of describing the function of a single individual. So uh, there's data everywhere and we need computers to be cheap and fast. Uh, Moore's law, uh, which uh, described the fact that every couple of years, the number of transistors on a microchip doubles. Um, this is, I find this still uh, quite staggering because my career has spanned from about 1978 when I first started using computers, where it looks like Motorola had one with 10,000 transistors on a chip. And right now we're up at 50,000 million, 50 billion on a chip. So the log scale up the side uh, is rather um, uh, false uh, in as much as if it were in uh, real scale, linear scale, it would be enormous, enormous rapid development of computing power. And also uh, the, the fact that the, it, it doubles, but also it's getting cheaper. So quantum computing uh, is on the horizon. Um, we have a dizzying promise from that. It uh, has the potential to solve certain types of problems. Uh, much more efficiently than classical computers. It could significantly speed up computations uh, for large databases. Um, but, uh, you know, as with much research, building and operating them in reality poses significant technical challenges. Although in the UK, we are very well placed to address those challenges and um, are certainly leading uh, in the field of research in quantum computing. Most interestingly for us, of course, uh, <coughs> It, despite these obstacles, it does offer promise for revolutionising fields such as including machine learning. So finally, amongst the enablers alongside big data, alongside computing power, we have algorithms and their development. So what is an algorithm? It's a process or set of rules to be followed uh, in calculations or other problem solving operations. Uh, they break down complex problems into smaller, more manageable steps. And I think this should be very familiar to the occupational therapists, if there are any on the call who are watching this, um, because I think that is what OTs are so brilliant at doing, is looking at overall function, breaking it down into individual steps, and then helping patients to uh, manage how to perform those individual steps better. Uh, there are many algorithmic techniques, many, many, many. Uh, I won't even read those out, but that's just a very small uh, set of them. And uh, for difficult problems, and the sort of things we're talking about in healthcare are difficult problems, AI uh, is limited by a concept called uh, combinatorial explosion. And what this is, is because you're giving the systems so much data and they have a huge inherent complexity to them, the, uh, that becomes an astronomical use of memory and computer time. Uh, and this, this in real life uh, limits what uh, computers can do with the algorithms that they are chunking through the data on. Um, 
So hence, we have a need for research into uh, efficient uh, algorithms. Right. So here's a couple of uh, relatively trivial examples of algorithms. I mean, I, I apologize for the triviality of them, but it, it's sometimes helpful. So making a peanut butter and jam sandwich. And I did get this from chat GPT. I said, well, give me a give me a straightforward algorithm. And uh, I think it must be American because I don't know too many people in the UK who eat peanut butter and jam. So there we are. You, you get your ingredients ready. You pick up two slices of bread from a bread package, open the jars, use a knife, click through it, clean knife for the next slot, place the slices together. If desired, there's a conditional thing here, use a knife to cut the sandwich, place it on a plate, sit down and eat it. So that's a that's a very simple algorithm. Uh, and they're not all having to be coded in uh, machine learning code on Python. Uh, they can just be written down in simple language. Here's another one, uh, more mathematical. So finding the maximum number in a list. You start with the first number, and label it as the maximum. You iterate through the remaining numbers in the list one by one. Compare them with the current maximum. If the current number is greater than the current maximum, you update the current maximum to be the current number. And repeat the steps until the list is completed. And once they've all compared, the current maximum will be the maximum number in the list. So algorithms don't are not something that is out of science fiction. They are uh, grounded in uh, the way in which we uh, work through tasks um, and hence my reference back to the occupational therapists in the audience. Now, um, I don't know who's in the audience, as I said, but, but in case some of you want real detail and are interested in the mathematics uh, of uh, algorithms, then this book uh, is a must. Um, it's it, it beautifully accessible and beautifully written um, and by a man called David Mackay, who was a brilliant and approachable man in Cambridge. Um, and I say was because he died in 2016, sadly. Um, I was lucky enough to know him briefly and intensely. Um, and that's an experience that I shall never forget and, and was genuinely inspirational. Now, we don't all need to be in the detail, but it, it can be helpful to have an overview of the research areas uh, in in AI and and these are uh, some of them. So machine learning we've just mentioned uh, which focuses on learning from data to make predictions or decisions and it has three particular types supervised unsupervised uh, reinforcement and uh, four types sorry uh, and deep learning. Uh, deep learning is a, a subset which uses you will have heard of artificial neural networks for complex data representation and a lot of the advances that have been made in image recognition, which is some of the work I've been involved in, uh, natural language processing and speech recognition uh, stem from developments in deep learning. NLP, natural language processing, not neuro-linguistic program programming, uh, which uh, I suspect some people may think it is, um, it deals with human computer language interaction and covers text understanding, sentiment analysis, machine translation, and, and so much more. And you just start to look at these research domains and imagine how, as these things develop, the wonderful applications that they could lead to in systems uh, which are uh, tuned to address real world problems. Uh, we've got reinforcement, computer vision, reinforcement learning, robotics, and so forth and so on. Um, I think knowledge representation and reasoning towards the end is really fascinating. And this includes making up ontologies, knowledge graphs and logical reasoning. So there's a whole whole science here uh, of uh, AI research that underpins the opportunity to do uh, clinically orientated research. OK, now given all this activity, um, <clears throat> where might AI be applied in at brain injury? Uh, well, in the image recognition for measurement, classification, and interpretation of scans, for sure, and I'll be talking a little about that, uh, for looking at video. Uh, so how do patients move? What do they do? What does that tell us? For looking at text, so you can only, if you look at uh, typed text uh, or uh, handwritten text. Now, now it's possible through image recognition techniques to analyse what that is saying uh, or indeed what it is representing and then what it is saying. It may be applied in outcome prediction 
acutely, so immediately post-injury, or as the rehabilitation process progresses. And it may indeed be uh, applied in the optimization uh, problems to improve control of complex processes, including resource allocation. And just to going back to the point about um, generative AI, it may generate content. Now, this is uh, a thing to beware. So generative AI, here we are. It's a class of artificial intelligence techniques that involve the creation of new content, data or information. Just pause on that. Think about that. It's making up stuff. It's creating new content, data or information that's similar to, but not exactly the same as the input data it was trained on. Now, there's a deep philosophical question in there. What use is new stuff that's created if it's not the same as the stuff it's been created upon? And what, what is it really telling us? So it's capable of generating novel outputs such as images, text. You know, we know this. This is all in news at the moment, isn't it? With these sort of dreadful things in social media. Or even entire scenarios based on patterns it has learned from a data set during training. So, for example, you know, it could generate the rehabilitation program for an individual, given the kind of injury that they've had. But how would we really know that that was appropriate? So they're typically generative AI trained on large data sets, employs a lot of techniques, neural networks, probabilistic models, reinforcement learning to generate content. And the applications uh, are across various fields, including storytelling, uh, as I've just said, image generation and drug discovery, helpfully. That is a, a looking like a very promising field and, and of course may have some real <coughs> application in around brain injury in due course. It, it has, all, however, also raised important ethical considerations and uh, for generating misleading or harmful content. And I think this is really where we have to be so incredibly uh, careful. OK. <clears throat> So now we've covered some background, let's look at uh, some specific applications that folks could focus on machine learning. And first, let's have a reminder of some of the basics of machine learning. So it trains algorithms, so it trains them, it, it helps them to learn to be smarter. These processes, it helps the processes to learn to do it better, to recognize patterns and make predictions. <clears throat> Involves data preparation algorithm selection, feature selection, this is what parts of the data you're going to look at, and model optimization to prevent overfitting. I'll mention overfitting uh, in a moment. Uh, well, in fact, I'll mention it now. Uh, overfitting is where you look at your training data and you make a fantastic assessment of it, uh, really precise, but then you look at more general data and the model has learnt to recognise the training data but it can't really make head nor tail of the broader data out there. So overfitting is a, a real problem in uh, machine learning. It encompasses, as I said, supervised learning with labelled data. And uh, the process of labelling is, of course, very time consuming and expensive. Unsupervised learning for hidden structure discovery without labels. That is a really fascinating uh, concept. If you think about it, these are systems that simply mathematical systems that are incorporated into the code, incorporated into computer ability that can look at data and say, OK, I'm going to make some sense out of that in the same way as you or I would. And that is at the nub of this. And in fact, it, it occurred to me how elegant it is to be giving a talk on a quite, uh, brain injury and AI when a lot of AI is modelled on the brain. Something to think rather deeply about, but not during this. Uh, deep learning is a subset of, which uses neural networks for complex pattern recognition. And in, in traumatic brain injury research, algorithms like uh, support vector machines, artificial neural networks and multi-layer perceptrons are, are chosen depending on the nature of the data and the desired outcome. So it is one key is selecting impactful variables. Uh, with model performance, so the performance of the algorithmic model evaluated by the sensitivity, the specificity, accuracy and uh, or rock area under the receiver operator curve. OK, and so here we are. Here's some current research. <clears throat> we'll run through them. 
Um, at the moment, uh, people have been looking at identifying mild traumatic brain injury using functional brain activity, been looking at detecting axonal injury, uh, predicting traumatic brain injury with CT, and detecting and quantifying subdural hematomas. Apologies for the spelling of hematomas there. So let's just click through a couple of these uh, studies. Uh, again, I'm just trying to illustrate the uh, headlines of you know, the sort of accuracy, the sort of performance uh, that is possible uh, and, and the general areas that have been uh, attempted. So the machine learning tool, at, so we're looking here at, at machine learning as a tool for diagnosis particularly that given mild traumatic brain injuries associated with dysregulated neural network functioning. And in one study here by uh, Vergara, they, he achieved a 92% area around the receiver operator curve, which is, which is a, a very, very credible performance in 48 patients. And what they looked at as they uh, employed dynamic functional network connectivity. Now I'm no radiologist, but you know, this is a pretty fancy technique. Uh, using uh, fMRI data to differentiate between mTBI patients and controls. And in their research, they found these four DFNC states during a five minute uh, fMRI period. And they used a linear uh, support vector machine model to classify that into healthy and controls. So they received 92% accuracy. Pretty impressive. Uh, in another study, um, there were 84 and 76% accuracy respectively achieved with a similar model, uh, the same team using other uh, techniques, resting state functional network con connectivity from fMRI and fractional anisotropy from diffusion MRI. So numbers like 92%, yes, I'd be pretty pretty comfortable that that was you know, getting towards what a human should be able to do for me. 84, mm, not so sure, 75, 76, I might be beginning to wonder, well, what's going to happen to the one in four that gets missed or isn't? Uh, uh, isn't as accurate as it perhaps could have been. So we move on to um, detecting axonal injury. Um, <clears throat> the uh, machine learning was used here uh, with the DTI, diffuse tensor imaging metrics, to detect axonal injury. And we know that axonal injury is a key determinant of clinical outcome. And again, very credibly, it achieved sensitivities and specificities above 0.9. Um, these two researchers trained SVM models again, uh, focusing on various like fractional uh, anisotropy and radial diffusivity uh, to differentiate patients with microbleeds. So microbleeds are really uh, considered to be the surrogate markers of traumatic axonal injury and are visible gradient echo and susceptibility weighted uh, imaging. Now, 0.9, very good. Okay. Both uh, of these studies were extended into a larger group of non microbleed patients to show generalizability in predicting cognitive function when compared to neuropsychological testing. And uh, it, the potential of machine learning to extend into clinical management of TBI patients with DAI uh, is therefore demonstrated. And in 2022, Mohammed uh, employed a CNN convolutional neural network model to predict favorable or unfavorable outcomes using the Glasgow outcome scale from MRIs of 38 patients who sustained moderate or severe TBI, uh, who had MRI evidence of diffuse external injury and achieved sensitivity, true positive of 0.99, so basically one, and area under the receiver operator curve of 0.91. So these are very credible uh, outcomes from these techniques uh, applied specifically to these problems. Um, again, we looked at uh, predicting uh, TBI with CT. Uh, this work looks at uh, identifying midline shift. So we know that midline shift of less than 10 millimeters on scans uh, implies better uh, prognosis. And uh, they use a convolutional neural network to identify and quantify intracranial hemorrhages. Sensitivities and specificities again up in the 0 0.8, 0 0.9. Um, predicting long-term outcomes post-TBI is vital for con 
clinical decision making. And in 2022, PEAS introduced a model combining CNN analysis with, of CT scans with clinical data to predict a six month outcome of severe TBI. And that fusion model in, outperformed the standard impact model when tested on uh, their internal data set and even surpassed the prediction of three neurosurgeons. I always have to have a wry smile there because neurosurgeons, I hope there aren't any in the audience, uh, are put up as a sort of paragons of, of all knowledge in uh, things neurological. Uh, and of course, they do have a tremendous contribution to make. Um, so finally, uh, ML has been applied to detecting and quantifying subdural hematomas. Um, and accurate segmentation allows both detect and volumetric analysis of these. Uh, however, manual volumetric evaluation is time consuming and often skipped in clinical practice. So this is this is where we begin to see some potential uh, near horizon applications of uh, AI uh, in speeding things up that are relatively straightforward. So it, it offers a faster alternative here, uh, which is crucial since subdural hematoma volume significantly influences prognosis, surgical intervention decisions, and also very importantly, the prediction of post-operative recurrence. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> um, and uh, in 2020, uh, Fasner uh, implemented a random forest model achieving a sensitivity of 0.99 and specificity 0.92. Fantastic. Uh, and then uh, interestingly, uh, by 2023, uh, there's another CNN model for comprehensive value of subdurals, looking at thickness, volume, midline shift, uh, showing how AI's progression in medical imaging analysis ha had been advancing. And that achieved sensitivities of 91.4 and specificity 96.4 in detecting and classifying severity of acute subdurals. These are all very impressive. Um, so, Having looked briefly at these specifics, the literature highlights some uh, important points. Um, key interests are that um, advanced imaging techniques such as neurite orientation, dispersion, density imaging are now becoming a focus for research alongside um, the biomarkers I mentioned before. With predicting long term outcomes, especially from mild traumatic brain injury, a notable challenge, the literature says. Applying ML to clinical practice demands both algorithm development and validation across different clinical settings. So this, this validation piece is so, so important in the whole area of um, uh, AI uh, applied to clinical uh, work. Uh, so a cautionary tale here. So PEAS, the work that we saw a little earlier, uh, the CNN model surpassed the impact model in the six month outcome prediction on internal data, but didn't show improvement on external validation. So that is really worrying. You know, it looked like it was great in research, but in practice, it probably not. And then we have to consider responsibility. So uh, Georgie touched on this with AI's growing role in diagnostics, establishing clear responsibility frameworks amongst healthcare providers, AI developers and stakeholders is essential. Uh, and addressing algorithmic bias is vital. Now, this is this is a really, really fundamental point in the development of machine learning techniques um, and indeed any algorithms, what is the inherent bias in the system? Um, and the, the gap, and just talking about radiology here, the gap between AI's development and its clinical application in radiology involves regulatory privacy, informed consent, intellectual property issues, as well as the impact of AI on decisions in clinical settings. So it's a really complex um, context for the translation of some of these pieces of research into something useful, not least amongst which is clinical skept clinician scepticism. And uh, there is a great deal of that around uh, at the moment. So the legal framework for AI in healthcare must evolve with the technology. And uh, clearly to achieve that, to uh, ensure patient safety and, and care effectiveness, collaboration amongst uh, a wide range of people, ethicists, legal experts, etc., is crucial uh, for the ethical use of <coughs> uh, in T TBI diagnosis and management. So, of course, data is complex. 
Um, the algorithms need a vast amount of it. Um, it's labeling it as an expensive, time-consuming process uh, for supervised machine learning. Overfitting, I've already mentioned, is a significant problem where it forms on the training data, but poor on new unseen cases. And achieving the right balance between a model's complexity and its ability to generalize involves careful planning and adjustments. This is the skill set of the um, of the AI engineer, if you will, um, or programmer or mathematician. There's a group of people who really understand how to play these models. Um, and adding AI to current healthcare IT systems is complex because in due course it will require training for clinicians and staff, which will be costly and disruptive. And heaven knows we don't need any more disruption to our health services than we already have in the UK. Uh, and making the tools user-friendly and smoothly integrated into everyday practice uh, is key for their successful adoption and therefore for them to have some uh, impact. So the scope of machine learning applied to brain injury is broader than just scan analysis. Um, it offers a wide opportunity to do diagnosis, sure, uh, but also predict outcomes, create personalized treatments, not using generative AI uh, or not so much, uh, monitoring recovery or using it carefully, shall we say, monitoring recovery and planning rehabilitation, my interest, of course. Personalized treatment plans powered by ML, analysis of genomic data, mark a move towards precision medicine in TBI. All, all of this should be possible. When is very hard to predict. Um, and this would, of course, allow predictions about an individual's susceptibility to TBI, uh, their treatment responses and long term risks based on their genetic makeup. So the use of wearable technology in managing TBI is also promising. And these devices help ML algorithms to track recovery, spot complications early and recommend interventions by continuously collecting data. And no presentation will be complete without considering cost. So uh, clearly there are some tremendous costs associated. I can see that my time is getting slightly tight, so I may just skim over one or two of the more generic messages here. Um, messages from the literature on ML in scan analysis, so we'll leave that. So here we are. These are a couple of um, studies that were done on applications and rehabilitation. Uh, this was looking mach using machine learning uh, to uh, but prolonged disorder of consciousness patients and it found in these 1170 patients uh, that um, they were able uh, to uh, improve predictions of outcomes for those patients using routine clinical data. Okay, They use four methods, uh, they're written there uh, and uh, the analyses found that more severe mode, this will be very clear to many of the senior clinicians amongst you, it's our experience, so it's interesting that the machine was able to replicate that. It found that the more severe motor impairment and complex disabilities were associated with not regaining consciousness, while less severe impairment and certain types of agitated behaviour were linked to emerging from PDOC. Um, another study um, showed uh, about prediction of the FIM, the FIM, functional independence measure. So uh, ML is now being used to predict how well patients with TBI will recover after inpatient rehabilitation. Um, study applies artificial intelligence to forecast FIM uh, and it says that commonly used scales like the GOS and DRS and so forth help to track progress, but they don't provide the detailed prognosis that patients and families need. And that's that's the great hope, the great aspiration of uh, AI. Um, models like crash and impact uh, <coughs> predict outcomes with only 75, 87 percent accuracy and predicting deaths or poor outcomes. So <clears throat> there's a gap here um, on using machine learning to predict outcomes for TBI, which could improve accuracy and provide better prognostic information. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> um, so the goal uh, is to evaluate how much impact the rehab has had on, on the fin. Um, they hypothesize that uh, rehabilitation's effects on certain aspects of independence can help improve how resources are used. 
<clears throat> and what they found was that ML, especially tree-based models like random forest and so forth, outperformed traditional statistics, uh, predicting FIM scores with a high accuracy, plus or minus one point on these seven point scales, for most or at least 14 out of the 18 scales, showing promise for real world application. The biggest errors, prediction errors, were in bowel and bladder control uh, and using stairs. So the limitation of the study, of course, was it was only applied to the subset of patients who had the resources to enter and stay in a rehabilitation service. It was American. Uh, we'll just skip that, except to say that at the end there, the key challenge in neuro rehabilitation research will be identifying statistical and machine learning methods capable of this kind of comprehensive analysis. Um, and this key challenge uh, is really partly what my work in Cambridge uh, is beginning to address. So ju just summarising, the, you know, got, we've looked at acute phase um, uh, research, looked at some rehabilitation research. Uh, it's easier to do the former because there's lots of data um, and that should the product development and integration should follow smoothly. More difficult to do the latter because the data is disparate and not routinely available. I think product development will lag uh, far behind and integration. Uh, we have in the UK, sadly, still a very low baseline for neuro rehabilitation uh, and <coughs> uh, it provides an opportunity to make great strides with modest improvements using fundamental techniques. And I just point to the Neurological Alliance comment in their Neuro Numbers publication uh, talking about data on neurological problems, saying it was a data desert. OK, so uh, I'd like to talk now very quickly about some problems of data and rehabilitation, uh, collection, most certainly uh, manual still, presentation handwritten. The splat plot is probably the most common overall functional um, uh, method, but still very crude. Um, patients, certainly in our medical legal practices, are asked to repeat their stories endlessly and endure repeated assessments. And often data is out of date when it's required. So <clears throat> we have a, a concept of a, a rehabilitation platform emerging in which imagine that a system where a patient's progress is tracked automatically and shown in a user friendly way. Each patient has their own virtual avatar, which updates based on real life activities. And it could connect to a database of expert advice to create a customised rehabilitation plan or rehabilitation prescription, which you will, of course, have heard of, um, for each patient to include functional data on functional ability and therapeutic input, uh, which will be enabled by data collection in the community from image, video, speech and text analysis. Remember, I mentioned those before. Might this be a more readily acquired data set than upstream data? Well, uh, it certainly uh, could be. Uh, readily available in the community. So we're developing or trying to develop a platform demonstrator of this, features of which will be uh, extraction of skeleton from video, activity classification, representation of impairment, ability and participation and so on. It needs a multidisciplinary team to develop it uh, and without that, you just cannot do this kind of complex work with an entrepreneur embodying the vision connecting uh, uh, vision uh, connections with the individual groups of uh, uh, the team and uh, taking prepared to take risk. So there's a reality gap. Uh, translation of R&D into clinical practice is where significant effort is needed. And AI and brain injury needs leaders. So Albert Einstein said, leader is one who out of the clutter brings simplicity, out of discord harmony, and out of difficulty opportunity. And I think that that is really relevant in our in our modern world. I did have a few emerging themes. I'm just going to highlight one or two. Um, trusted relationships are central to all of this. Human engagement and usability factors are important. Um, it's difficult to build and maintain trust about data or rebuild it if it's lost. Uh, this is the wild west at the moment. And if you're going to do these developments, you need uh, money, so you've got to make the business case. I think most importantly here is capturing deep insights from clinicians who say it, who use it, who evangelize it, and state their careers and reputations on tech benefits. That will be so important going forwards. Uh, patients also need assurance of data confidentiality. Clinician engagement is so important, uh, and in my view is ideally patients should hold their data and consent to its use. 
one thing here halfway down the ml black box concept which is central to all of these uh, large models uh, is at odds with the regulatory fit for purpose agenda so explainable ai is emerging to counter this so my conclusions rather hurriedly i'm afraid are that ai is an incredibly uh, complicated technology, increasingly so. It's very expensive to develop, very substantial technology transfer barriers in healthcare in particular. It has enormous potential to create change. Um, and I think you should expect evolution, not revolution. And in considering it, think augmented human intelligence, not artificial intelligence, because I think that's a much more realistic representation of what is going to uh, evolve. So uh, thank you very much. This slide isn't particularly relevant to AI, but I thought it was quite amusing. Sorry to have run a little over. Uh, I'm happy to take questions if there are some. Wonderful, thank you, Dr. Bonikowski. Um, that was really, really interesting. And thank you for taking the time to speak to us all today. We have had quite a lot of questions actually, so apologies in advance, we might not be able to get through them all. Um, as I mentioned before, we will respond on an email to you all um, if we don't get time to respond to your questions directly. Um, so Dr. Bonikowski, first question, which was one that was received um, ahead of time, what are your thoughts and insights on AI applicable to the field of neuropsychology? Uh, it, it certainly will be. I mean, neuropsychology, like any uh, other aspect of our clinical record, it is essentially data. Um, and once we are able to package the data uh, from the neuropsychological evaluations and testing, uh, then we can perform any kind of number of uh, uh, mathematical tricks on that to um, make predictions, to analyse it. Uh, so it, it absolutely uh, should be uh, relevant and helpful to neuropsychological uh, testing and the development of that and its incorporation more widely. Um, <clears throat> I suppose it's also be possible to uh, use generative AI to generate uh, tasks for people to um, attempt and then to analyse how they have performed neuropsychologically on that. So, you know, it, 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 it's, it's all about data. Neuropsychology is just one pocket of, of data so definitely will have application wonderful thank you next question we've had from the chat function um asks in your current research at cambridge are there any exciting developments in quantum computing to further enhance the quality of mri imaging and brain injury especially in terms of enhancing color contrast in dynamic evolving clinical situations in acute brain injury so I've talked about scans because uh, I was trying to give you a broad overview of the field. Uh, I can't tell you whether there is uh, that degree of specific research going on. Uh, I suspect that not, because I think the development of quantum computing is still very much in its infancy in terms of applications. Um, what I think would probably be more relevant is the use of current fast conventional computing to address those kind of um, features in, in scan analysis. But no, I don't know of any specifically, uh, but I would not be at all surprised if that was going on. The, I, I don't think quantum computing has, you know, is, is a near horizon thing in, in practical reality. Uh, some people talk about it being 50 years away, 30 years away. Most optimistically, they talk about 10 years potentially. Uh, it's not my field of specialist expertise, um, but I certainly could look into it and respond to the questioner uh, on email. Lovely, thank you. Um, given the age old, there's a brain injury and there's the brain, implying an idiosyncratic and differential effect of a brain injury, will the training data ever be sufficient to encompass all brain injuries? And if so, would it be ethical to include it all? Well, it's, it's certainly ethical to include uh, all data. Um, provided it is appropriately screened and qualified and labelled um, because you know, if, if it represents reality, then the, the machine learning models, the AI models have to consider that reality. Um, I, I, I'm not sure that that will have answered the question, but it's quite a complex question actually. Uh, does that answer it for you, Georgie? Yeah, I think if... Um... If not, maybe we could send a response by email, but I think I think if the question helpful. is unhappy with the answer. Please, please get in touch <laughs> with me and I'll I'll respond more fully. 
So final question, would it be safer or possible to localise data sets? Current AI, as you mentioned, extracts data from external sources. What if you were to completely internalise data which is used by the system? Um, again, I don't fully understand that question. If you internalise data that's used by the system, then uh, you're not looking at the wide experience. Um, so you're really looking at your creating a training set on which you're just going to go round and round and round in circles rather than look at a much broader experience. So uh, again, that's a very uh, deep question that I'm not sure I have the answer to. We'll ask one more. Um, okay. Magulla and Potts 1943 proposed a logical calculus of the ideas imminent in nervous activity. Um, given your points surrounding AI's applications to neurorehabilitation, would a follow-up study likely build on this? <laughs> yes, I think a follow-up study would be a great idea. Um, I mean, any, any um, work on rehabilitation and the use of predictive models uh, would be very welcome in the field, I think, because it is definitely a, a field that is a backwater still. And I think we have to step up and use AI to the, the powerful AI revolution to, to put neuro rehabilitation back more on a par with some of the other clinical disciplines. So, yes, I think that would be a great idea. Wonderful. Thank you. We have a comment um, from someone in the audience. They've said, I'm an OT and thank you for your recognition of our skills. Um, we have another comment that said this isn't a question uh, that needs answering, but I wanted to know if you're aware of Louisa Mate. I think it's a therapy tool that tracks activity and progress for rehab. Um, it would be great um, to look at the online platform with the avatar, etc. I think I pronounced that right. I'm aware of it, yeah. Super. Well, thank you everyone for attending. It's been a really great turnout, a really great session. Anybody that we haven't responded to directly for a question, we will send you um, a response in an email. Um, you will receive the recording, the feedback link and the slides by email as well. Um, by way of reminder, please do sign up to the next webinar on AI and spinal cord injury um, on the 12th of June 2024 and the National Brain Injury Conference on the 4th of July. Um, if you could take the time to leave feedback via the link, then that would be great. Um, but thank you so much for your attendance and to Dr. Wonikowski for his time. Okay.